What's happening, Packer fans? Welcome to this Wednesday edition of the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. I have so incredibly much that I want to get to today, including Tremont Williams' retirement, Bobby Tunyon's restricted free agent tender, as well as Tyler Lancaster and Chandon Sullivan. Uh, of course, you know, we've got a variety of updates throughout the NFL. Andy Dalton's a Chicago Bear. Jamal Williams is a Detroit Lion. There is so much that I want to get to, but I would be completely remiss if I did not start off today's show with Tremont Williams, who, uh, just putting my fan hat on for a, me- uh, a second here, Tremont is on my Mount Rushmore of all-time favorite Packers. I-, I mean, his play leading up to the Super Bowl and going from undrafted free agent to damn near shut down corner on that path to the Super Bowl. And I, I don't say that lightly. I think the the shutdown corner moniker gets tossed around, you know, way too often. But man, the way that he played that season and the big plays that he came up with when Green Bay needed him most. I mean, basically sealing uh, the Super Bowl with the incompletion at the end. The the my favorite play, or arguably my favorite Packer play of all time, the pick six against the Falcons in the divisional round leading up to the Super Bowl. I mean, just his overall play was at an entirely different level. Of course, ends with three stints on the Packers, you know, he, his original stint, and then, you know, leaves for a bit, comes back for his second stint, and then leaves again uh, for uh, a cup of coffee, and then comes back on the practice squad, only to not play in the NFC Championship game. But this is somebody who is, I mean, this is the the story that you love to tell uh, as a analyst, as a fan, as a member of the media, it, like it doesn't matter. Like the the Tremont Williams story is just phenomenal. The undrafted free agent finding him as this hidden gem, and and just to see him go out and have a career the way that he was able to have is, it, I mean, it's just the best. And if for anyone that got to cover him in the locker room, which I barely did, like I'm so happy that in my you know few appearances in the locker room in 2019 before everything obviously shut down due to COVID in 2020, I actually got to, you know, ask Tremont Williams questions and just see what everyone's been talking about for years and just how open he is, how forthcoming he is, how much time he takes. There's literally not a bad word to say about Tremont. All of his teammates have had nothing but glowing things to say. And we, we never know who somebody truly is as a person, right? We, we we just don't have that level of access, nor probably should we have that level of access. But Every story you hear from every person that's willing to tell the story has nothing but glowing things to say about Tremont Williams. And of course, as a fan, his on the field too, um, just just nothing short of astounding where he was able to come from and ultimately get to in his career. A first ballot Packers Hall of Famer and uh, somebody that I think will, will go down being remembered incredibly fondly for his contributions as a Green Bay Packer. Again, on my Mount Rushmore, a favorite Packers of all times, uh, all time. And uh, I mean, just that secondary in the Super Bowl, Woodson and, and Tremont and Sam Shields, Nick Collins, so much fun to watch. And, and just seeing those, you know, that group of defensive backs kind of progress through those seasons. Uh, again, I've, I have nothing but just glowing things to say. So I don't want to say that this like hit me hard. I wasn't, you know, on, in tears at my desk or anything today, but there are very few players. In fact, Favre definitely was one. I don't know that there's any other where I legitimately just had to pause for a second and be like, damn it, I, I just really wish I could go back in time and watch this player play one more time in his, you know, in his prime and, and just watch how good he was. That's how I felt today. I just wanted to pause time and go back in time and, and watch Tremont play uh, just a handful more snaps. And of course, we have the ability to do that on Game Pass, but you know what I mean. He's just, again, an all-time favorite. Uh, consummate professional. I'm going to miss watching him play football and kudos on just one of the best careers, uh, you know, and, and I hope you have an amazing retirement. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm beaming about Tremont because of his time at, at Green Bay while also simultaneously just being insanely bummed that we're never going to get to see him on an NFL field again. But how perfect, 38 years old on his birthday, retires number 38 with 38 career interceptions, just chef kiss perfect. And kudos and congratulations to Tremont Williams. All right, let's go over some restricted free agents next. Um, Green Bay had to tender their restricted free agents, and they had three more players that they kind of needed to get through. The first and biggest one was Bobby Tunyon. And no surprise here, I said all offseason, 
I mentioned I've got a couple things wrong this offseason, right? But this is one that I had, you know, kind of pegged all the way along. Uh, Bobby Tonya getting the second round tender. I didn't think the first was necessary. And as Green Bay's trying to find every dollar that they can, I thought the additional million plus to give him a first round tender, um, you know, just wasn't worth, uh, you know, the the additional money. I don't think there's risk here that that Tunyon's going to get signed. I know there was some talk around uh, Twitter and, and, you know, just around fan boards and things like that, that uh, potentially maybe some team could offer Bobby Tunyon a big deal. and, And because Green Bay doesn't have the salary cap space, that they could lose him. I don't think... And again, I've been wrong a couple times this offseason already. I don't think the value is there for a second round pick for Bobby Tunyon. And this is saying as one of the core members of the Bobby Tunyon fan club for as long as I can, basically since the day he stepped on a Green Bay practice field, literally, um, I, I just don't see it. I, you know, when, when teams are valuing second round picks, these are, you know, for the top teams, these are top 50 picks, even the worst ones, what, 64th overall. You know, I don't see a team valuing Bobby Tunyon with a, a you know a top fifty pick in this draft, and a lot of those teams towards the end have their own financial issues uh, also. And then you have to match them with a team that's looking for a tight end. I just I don't simply see it. And you know I was asked uh, I was on you know doing a radio hit now with John Papadopoulos in lacrosse, and he asked me you know do I think that you know he's worth a second round tender, and was you know Tunyon's play of his own accord, or was it you know kind of due to scheme and Rodgers and things like that? And it's a little bit of both. You know Tunyon's really built himself into a overall tight end. He's a much better blocker than he ever was in the past. Not great, but certainly serviceable. And he's a much better receiving tight end. He finally put everything together. And, you know, it was interesting. You would see at times where he would get the benefit of some scheme from Matt LaFleur and some great plays by Aaron Rodgers and just kind of be right place, right time. There would be other plays where he actually worked himself open. And unfortunately, Rodgers just didn't see him or the ball didn't come his way. So there's definitely a little bit of both. And again, his improved blocking is a huge kudos to Tunyon himself and his coaching staff. And there's no question that Tunyon has great value for Green Bay. And I don't think Green Bay wants him to go anywhere. Yes, there's a ton of value in a second round pick. And I think they would, if some team decided to give him a huge offer, I think they would take the second round pick and hope that it was a team that was picking in the top 50, you know, the earlier, the better. I, I don't see that happening. I don't think some other team is going to value Bobby Tunyon in that regards. I know the tight end class after Pitts isn't great um, in this draft, but I, I just think that some team is going to value their second round pick and a big contract more than they're going to value Bobby Tunyon. And again, that's the thing here, right? It's not just giving him a second round pick, but you also have to sign him to a deal that would outmatch any other team uh, that's potentially vying for his services. And of course, Green Bay from matching that contract. So I don't see that happening. And I I think, again, I don't think other teams are going to value that second round pick. And I think if you're Green Bay, you would also want to keep him. I I don't see Green Bay wanting to trade, even if they could trade him for a second round pick. Green Bay has fought through tooth and nail to find a tight end that they can trust the way that they can trust Bobby Tunyon right now. And I, I just think that you don't, you know, you don't wish that off. Jared Cook left after a year. Martellus Bennett was a disaster. Jimmy Graham was a disaster. Uh, Jermichael, ever since Jermichael Finley's injury, it's basically been like this cursed position besides like a half season of Jared Cook and now this last season of, of Bobby Tunyon. So you finally have a player that fits that role really well. I don't think you want him to go anywhere. I expect him to be back on a one-year second round tender and, you know, about a little over $3 million this season. And I think, you know, towards the end of this year, they'll look at trying to, you know, get him on a longer term deal would be my guess. Shannon Sullivan was a little bit more interesting. I thought this one could have gone either way, either not tendering him and trying to get him back at a lower price or just tendering him at the $2 million uh, right of first refusal. That's ultimately what they decided to do. Remember though, this doesn't guarantee anything. He has no guarantees on his deal. And if Green Bay picks a, uh, you know, picks up a couple corners via free agency or the draft and they get through training camp and they just realize that, you know, uh, Sullivan's not one of the top players, they could release him and, and save all that money and not have to keep that on their books. So the fact that it's not guaranteed may have been what kind of swung the, the balance here for Green Bay and taking a flyer on him now. And remember, they don't have to wait either. If all of a sudden they need to sign a top tier corner because it becomes available and they need every penny they can get, they can just say we're rescinding the offer or if he's already signed it, release him. And again, no harm, no foul, like, you know, for Shannon Sullivan there is, but for Green Bay, um, that's just, you know, kind of the art of doing business, unfortunately. So 
I don't think he's guaranteed anything. I think this is the right move for now because there's no guarantees. Uh, but I think this was a 50-50 you know, chance that he could have either gotten signed or, or just say, hey, we're not going to tender you. Uh, but for now, he'll be on the team, and I think he's going to have a chance to make a roster spot. And I think ultimately he will end up on the roster, uh, but he's still going to have to earn that as the rest of this offseason moves, moves along. Similar, you know, similarly, Tyler Lancaster uh, did not receive an offer. I thought that one could have gone either way as well. I don't think, like Raven Green, that this necessarily, you know, spells the end of Lancaster's um, term in Green Bay. I think he could be brought back on a lesser deal if he doesn't find anything in free agency. But for now, Lancaster is not tendered and will become an unrestricted free agent. Next big piece of news: Jamal Williams signs with the Detroit Lions, two years, seven point five million dollar deal. I know some have been surprised that that deal wasn't very high. I am not one of those people, and I've been fairly transparent. I love Jamal Williams, right? I, he's just, he's a great personality, loved having him on the team, wish he was still on the team, but he's just not dynamic enough. At some point, you need your playmakers to make plays. Williams is a great pass protector. He can catch the ball of the backfield well enough, more of a screen type receiver than like a down the field type receiver, but he certainly improved in that regards but he just doesn't have the acceleration and burst or the ability to make people miss in the open field. He's mostly a player who's going to get what's blocked for him. And even then, he's not a patient runner. He's a straight ahead, you know, downhill running back. There's certainly value for him in this league, but to me, that value is about two years, $7.5 million, which is exactly what Detroit gave him. There's just not enough playmaking juice there uh, for him. Of course, of course, of course, he ends up going to an NFC North team because the Lions, Bears, and Vikings love you know, the, the scrap heap if Green Bay doesn't bring back a player. Um, so he ends up with Detroit. I don't love the fit because, well, one, they're not a very good team. Two, uh, you know, you've already got on Johnson and DeAndre Swift there. So, you know, he's going to have to fight for carry. So I don't love that for Jamal, uh, but we'll see what happens. And, you know, if you're a Packer fan, you still get to chew, you know, cheer for Jamal, you know, four times a year against Minnesota and Chicago. Uh, what's better, as long as the Lions aren't playing the Packers, you can cheer for him on Thanksgiving, hopefully see him do a little bit of dancing. So um, love, uh, you know, Jamal, hope that, you know, he goes on to have a great career unless he's playing against the Packers. Uh, but don't love the fit, not surprised by the contract. And uh, we'll see how he ultimately ends up in fairs in Detroit moving forward. The big news of the day, of course, the best news. How as a Packer fan can you not love, 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 love Andy Dalton to the Chicago Bears? The Bears are in a must win now scenario. It sounds like they did everything in their power to try to get Russell Wilson. They couldn't. And the consolation, look at this smile. The, the consolation prize was Andy Dalton. How can you not absolutely love that as a Packer fan? And listen, maybe I'll eat crow eventually, and maybe Russell Wilson becomes available, or maybe Deshaun Watson becomes available, and they end up striking it rich. But it certainly seems like the um, ship has sailed on Russell Wilson, and uh, you know this certainly complicates things if they do look to try to get another quarterback. It's not totally out of the realm of possibility, but it certainly seems like Andy Dalton's going to be the starter at this point. That Mitch Trubisky, unfortunately, will be gone, which of course is a sad day as well. But when you replace him with basically an older, slower version of Mitch Trubisky, it's tough not to be super excited as a Packer fan. So you got to love that for Green Bay. And again, this is a must-win situation for Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace, and they end up with Andy Dalton. Maybe they'll end up with a really great rookie in the draft, and maybe he'll surprise. I don't think that's going to be the case. We'll see what happens. But um, as of today, you know that was that was a fun fun moment for Packer fans as, as the, the division is now Jared Goff, Andy Dalton, Kirk Cousins, and oh yeah, Aaron Rodgers. So not a bad day to be a Packer fan in that regards. One other move that did happen, Adoree Jackson was cut by the uh, Tennessee Titans. That is a very intriguing name to me. I know he was injured last season, came back from injury and just did not look himself, but had three really good seasons prior to that. Don't think he ever quite lived up to the first round moniker. I think he was a top 20 pick. I don't think he ever really reached those heights, but he was always a good uh, to solid cornerback. If he breaks the bank, you know, one Green Bay is not going to be able to do it. And I think if he gets a top tier deal, uh, even a mid to high tier deal, I think you got to be out on that. But I, I really think Green Bay is going to add a corner. Remember, no comp pick here for Adoree Jackson since he was released. This is one name that I'm really intrigued by. I think he pairs well with Jair. Not very athletic. Um, and he, again, and, and you know, he doesn't have to be the guy in Green Bay. He can be the number two to Jair. And I think there's a lot of value there for Adoree Jackson. 
A couple other really quick moves. I hated on the Jaguars and the Patriots uh, yesterday. I actually really liked some of the things that both of those teams did on day two of the, what, the free agency period or the legal tampering period, whatever we're calling it. I do really like the Patriots teaming up John U. Smith and Hunter Henry with a Cam Newton power offense with their run, their stable of running backs. Edelman on the outside, of course, they get Kendrick Bourne um, and uh, Nelson Aguilar. I kind of like the offense that they're putting together. If they can put together a top tier defense with all their guys coming back and some of the signings that they made, it's going to need to be a real top tier defense, but Belichick's a great defensive mind. They may have some pieces to do so. This offense might just be interesting enough with what they're able to do from a, you know, just a, a power offense standpoint against teams that are, you know, kind of going smaller and quicker on defense. Uh, with a power runner and, and Cam Newton, I'm intrigued. And I do like them pairing Hunter Henry and John U. Smith together. And then the Jaguars, you know, they picked CJ Henderson last year in the draft, a player that, you know, didn't live up to the hype last year, but still has a ton of potential. They bring Sidney Jones back, who I mentioned as a potential Packer target. And then they also go out and get Shaq Griffin from Seattle. I think that starts to put together some really nice pieces in the cornerback room for the Jaguars. And I do like what they did. Even though I haven't liked their offseason up to this point, I thought solidifying that cornerback room was a really smart move for them with Jones, Griffin, and of course, CJ Henderson. So some nice moves. I still don't have anything nice to say about the Texans, so I won't say anything nice about the Texans. That's mostly going to do it for me. The Packers are one of six teams, I believe, as I'm recording this, that have still not made a move in free agency. And two of those teams, Philly and uh, Indianapolis, of course, have uh, have made, or excuse me, the the Rams in Indianapolis have made some moves at the quarterback position uh, with Carson Wentz and, of course, Matthew Stafford. So Green Bay, one of only four teams that hasn't really made a move at all this offseason up until this point. Maybe as you're listening to this, the Packers have made a huge free agent move, and uh, you can ignore the words that I'm speaking right now. But as I'm recording this, Green Bay is one of six teams who has not made a free agent you know, acquisition from another team at this point. So we'll see if something happens soon. Last but not least, um, I tweeted out uh, for Corey Lindsley and uh, his family, they have been super supportive of the Green Bay area, including Casa of Brown County. If you're not familiar, make sure to check out their you know, nonprofit and the work that they have done. I recommend it on Twitter. If you haven't yet, you know, go out, donate $63 in honor of Corey Lindsley and his contributions to Green Bay, to Casa of Brown County. And uh, I just think it's a really great cause. And uh, there were a ton of donations, $63 donations in honor of Corey and Anna and the work that they've done in the community. So just an idea. If you can't do 63, do $6.30. Do whatever you can make work. Or just retweet the tweet that I sent out for awareness or tell somebody. But uh, trying to honor Corey Lindsley and, and Anna Lindsley for all the work that they've done in Green Bay by donating $63 to, to Casa of Brown County, um, which they've been super supportive of. So if you have the opportunity and the ability to do so, make sure to check that out. And uh, if you can't do something, no worries, but maybe we, you know raise some awareness for it. That's going to do it for me. Make sure to check out Dusty, Steve, and Sarah on a special guest on today's audio version of the podcast. Um, I'll be right back here tomorrow, of course, so subscribe if you haven't already. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!